Hello everybody and welcome to Assessment 4, Diet History and Intake and Documentation. And I'll explain that clunky title as we go forward. So we're at uh, the D in ABCD, which is Dietary Intakes. And this is uh, almost, a mo I know I say this in probably every section except maybe labs, but this may be the most important part of this. The best way to determine is your patient malnourished or at risk of malnourishment is well what are they eating now what are, what have they been eating uh, that's that's the best way to determine malnutrition and so you have questions to answer here is like is your patient meeting needs were they before you saw them it's important to get this information uh, accurate to be able to assess correctly and unfortunately we have a situation here that you need to trust but verify what they say now, the way, this, as we, blah, 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 to get that information, uh, essentially what we have to do is ask questions. That That's the only tool we have. Uh, this is typically done through the, like, histories or journals tools. So we're asking, you know, what does the patient normally eat? How often do they eat that? These break down into three basic types, which is a seven-day look back, a food journal, or a 24-hour intake. Now, there are problems with intakes, as I've already indicated. Uh, several, actually. Uh, the first one is poor memory. And, you know, this isn't a situation of, oh, older person has a hard time remembering where things are. This is, I, you know, I said, quick, what did you have for lunch last Tuesday? Do you have any idea? Chances are you don't, unless it was something significant. You know, we tend to... We actually roll that into the next one, which is that we have a recall bias. Everybody does. Which is we tend to remember unusual or special events at the detriment of normal events. And that makes sense. You only have so much like RAM up there to hold things in place. So if it's something's not important, you'll ditch it. But you probably don't remember what you had to eat unless it was, I don't know, a first date or uh, it was your mom's birthday or your your, your bestie came into town, you haven't seen him for a long time, so you guys got lunch together. Those you probably remember, and you can probably recall in great detail what happened, what you had, what was going on, where you were. But on another day, if you just, you know, made a sandwich at home and binge-watched Netflix while you were having lunch, chances are you're not remembering that really well, right? The other thing that comes up is that people will tell authority figures what they should be saying. You know, yes, I eat veg my fruits and vegetables every day. Yes, I make sure to get at least 30 minutes of exercise. And you know, lest you think that you are not an authority figure as you walk in there with your tablet or your notepad and, maybe, and your name tag, maybe your white jacket on, let, let me disabuse you of that. You are an authority figure. And you're an authority figure with very clear-cut answers that people think are correct. And they want to give you the right answers. So you're wanting to get an accurate intake for this person. They're trying to give you the correct, you know, the right, again, information, which causes a bit of a conflict. Um, another problem, and... Almost the biggest one, maybe, is that people are not good at estimating how much and how frequently they eat. Uh, this seems to be more of a deviation in obese patients than non-obese, but everybody is pretty bad at it. And this comes with a question on what history to use. A more in-depth look back will have more detailed information in it, but it may be less accurate due to compounding errors. If somebody is not remembering things well or they're not telling you everything, then this detailed information is going to compound its incorrectness throughout the whole questionnaire. Uh, the other end of this is if you have a simple look back, it will have less error because there will be inherently less chances to make a mistake and people will be more likely to do one that takes less time. But by design, almost, it's going to be less accurate. So either way, you have some challenge in getting information. Now, here's a, here's a little ray of sunshine for you. Uh, training and education can improve those skills of estimating 
how much they ate and how frequently they ate. Uh, dietitians were significantly uh, better at estimating caloric content. This is like energy and volume versus a control. Uh, the uh, average person did a little bit over 400 calories, uh, incorrect estimation, generally over, uh, by about almost 150 calories, plus or minus. Dietitians were half that. So I guess you'll pat yourself on the back. Isn't it nice to know that this time you spent in school has not been wasted? It is, in fact, demonstrably proven to be beneficial. So you have a skill set that not many other people have. You can look at a plate of food and do some quick uh, back of the math, back of the math, back of the envelope math, and come up with a pretty accurate assessment of what, how much is on that plate. And that's a skill that other people do not have. So we're going to break down what what different tools we use are. The first one's a seven day look back. And this is, I, ideally, I guess this is in a facility. When you have somebody coming into a facility for the first time, this is it's exactly what it says it is. It's a seven day review of food intake. It's usually like how many times in the last seven days have you had thing. Uh, the pros of this are that it's a better picture of an average intake, sorta. It also allows for grouping of foods. The cause is it tends to overestimate intake. Again, people are not great at being able to uh, estimate how much or how often they had something. They're also, again, with a seven-day look back, things get a bit foggy for them as you go backward. And again, that, that's for everybody. So you may not be getting a very accurate picture. A food journal is a list of everything eaten over a given period of time. Uh, it's this, this is essentially what most interactive calorie counters are. You eat something, you put it in, um, that's that's the whole thing. If, if, you, if it goes in the mouth, it goes into the journal. Um, the, the good side of this, the pros, is that uh, no, there's, there's no recall time, right? That, that error of memory is gone because you do it immediately af after you eat. Uh, so it can be extremely accurate. The con of this is that it's a tremendous time and energy sink for patients. So um, remember what I said earlier, the more time and energy somebody has to put into something that they don't necessarily see the benefit of, the less likely they are to do it well. And it is very hard to get somebody to do this because eating is something we do. It's something we do regularly, multiple times in a day. That's a lot of time commitment from somebody. Uh, the other problem with this is it is perspective. Nobody comes rolling in, or very few people, with a food journal. I, I, you might get somebody who does do that just because they're trying to lose weight or something. But very often what you're going to have is from this point forward, we're going to record what you eat. That means that you have no idea what they were doing before and you don't... How do I say this? When they know they're being watched, they may not... The good side is they may eat better, try to even things out more, a little bit healthier food choices, but it's not going to be reflective of what they did in the past. And the 24-hour recall is a list of everything eaten in the last 24 hours. The uh, good news is that this can be this tool can be used both prospectively and retrospectively. So, um, again, you know, this is easy and fast for the patient. It can be retrospective because it's not that hard to remember what you had did 24 hours ago uh, versus you know, last week. So all we're asking is the 24 hours here. Uh, also, you can either do it in a facility, then it's very easy, or they can do it at home. But again, this is just one day. All we're asking for is a day and just give me a list of what you had. So it's not very time committed or very time intensive either. The con is that it's a little bit of a crapshoot here. Uh, let's go back to that other example. You know, maybe it was mom's birthday and we went out and we all had a big dinner and then we had dessert or we had cake and uh, had a couple of drinks. That's probably not reflective of the normal intake, but if someone's doing it honestly, that's what they're going to put in. So it's a little bit of luck of the draw there. The... What appears to have the highest precision is multiple 24-hour recalls over a period of time, at least three. 
So you want at least 72 hours of information, ideally spread out over a few different days and definitely ideally both retrospective and prospective ones. So you get a, a maybe 24 hour recall of when someone's there, well, before they got there, excuse me, um, and then maybe the next day. This this is very much depends on the situation of your patient. Another option here is in facility data, um, and this is this is this would take the place of a food history journal. If you have somebody, if you have a patient in a facility, that facility is going to keep a record of what they ate, how much of it they ate, and you'll be able to pull that information from the chart. There are each facility chooses its own system. There are two main ones, which is uh, either the points system or the percentage system. There's not a good deal of literature that supports either of these systems, really. Uh, it's kind of up to the system's own discretion what it wants to do. And uh, so either one, again, the, the more important thing is consistency across the board. So as long as that patient is there, you have an, at least a standard measure that you're comparing what they t ate to. Uh, an upside of this is that in the facility, you know the calories and protein uh, that they have eaten because that either um, you have a, me a blah, 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 blah. you have a menu that you have either written or approved as the dietitian or you have the information available to you from the company either uh, your facility is part of a large corporate structure and they have a corporate menu that they use or you're getting one from maybe a food vendor. Most large food vendors will also provide menus for facilities. If you get those, you get the uh, also get the, all of the nutritional data from those menus. So you may have that way. Either way, you know what's in that menu. You know what's available. Um, now, the downside of this is that you are dependent on other people calculating intake. You are dependent on, a, on, on the nursing staff Usually, maybe you have a diet tech who's doing that, but it's not you. All you're doing is looking at information that somebody else is taking. And uh, calorie counts. We'll talk about calorie counts very briefly. They're typically done in 24-hour increments. Uh, 72 hours is kind of traditional, I guess. Uh, nursing, every place I have been, I should, I should preface that, every place I have worked, Nursing collects a list of food and beverage intake. What they typically do is most places will have a ticket for that individual that has what they've chosen to eat for the day, uh, lists the amount, three ounce char patty, four ounces green beans, something like that. And then it will say beside it, the nurse will note 50% of that was eaten, 75% of this, all of that. So then you get those tickets you then get to make some calculations on uh, what they ate and how much that was, how much they ate of, you know, what, what the calorie and protein count of that was. In my experience, I mean, you could obviously do more than that, right? In my experience, when a calorie count is uh, ordered, either by you or by the physician, typically the concern is protein and or calories. There's not a lot of calorie counts like, what was the sodium intake for the last 24 hours? It could be. You you could, in theory, do that, but I've never had anyone ask. It's almost always due to weight fluctuations. We want to see what somebody's eating macro-level nutrients. Um, it's typically used to determine if weight loss or gain is intake-related or if they're just not meeting their needs. Uh, it also is used often when you have a patient who has been on enteral or parenteral nutrition and the decision has been made to try to wean them off of that. Typically what happens is you'll do a graduated reduction over time. There'll be a time when they're getting a little bit, just like a trophic feeding of say enteral uh, nutrition. And they're trying, the idea is that they're trying to eat on their own. So the cal you're asked to do calculations to see if they're meeting their basic needs so we can safely stop the enteral feeding. Okay, um, this one is very short, and I, I seriously debated between doing two separate uh, lectures here with documentation and um, diet histories, 
And I decided we had plenty of ones. The first part of this had tons of presentations. Uh, I So I tacked this onto the end of the short one. Also, they both start with D. So my theming is on point. So we're going to talk about uh, nutrition documentation. Um, it breaks down into two large categories. And I can be honest with you here. I'm not 100% sure why the Academy wants you to be able to differentiate these two things so badly, but it really does. Um, you will, if, if you are not yet a dietitian and you have the exam coming up, it's going to ask you about this. When I did my uh, specialization in gerontology, I was asked to define them again. So this is a, they really want you to understand this. So you have screenings and you have assessments. A screening is a very is the first thing everybody that comes into a facility gets a nutrition screening. The screening is a very very brief evaluation of everyone. It identifies people at nutrition risk, and is used to either set up a monitoring point to continue checking them, or to then notify the dietitian that there is someone at risk. It can be generally they can be conducted without nutrition education and very very minimal training. So. Anybody can do this. The um, ed nursing staff typically does it. A diet tech can do it. Um, the admissions people can do it. I, I have very rarely seen that happen, but you know, especially if you're working in long-term care, a lot of times it's everybody on deck for when a new person comes in because staffing is not, they're not stacked fat there. So um, honestly, and even the family or the um, patient themselves can do it often. So, Anyone with the tools can do this. Um, for nutrition documentation, again, kind of get used to this theme in gerontology, okay? There is no best or endorsed tool for nutrition screening. There are a lot of them, and a lot of them have been validated. So it's not like it's the Wild West out there. There are options. Um the one that we use that I I set up the documentation. We recently changed um, charting systems. I set up the documentation for the nutrition department. My choice for the screening process was the very confusingly named mini nutritional assessment. So even though they want you to be able to tell the difference between screening and assessments, they don't name them well. Uh, the mini nutritional assessment is designed specifically for elders. That's one of the best parts of it in my mind, is that there aren't a lot of things that are really targeted at elders. So the MNA is, and that's typically called actually the mini. So we get run into someone saying, we use the mini or the MNA, that's what it is. So it's specifically targeted for elders. It requires no um, specific, um, it requires no specific training or um, focus on, and it's very quick to do. I'm not explaining that very well. Uh, it's only six questions long, and it can be self-conducted. Uh, again, you can, if you have a patient who does not have dementia issues or uh, dis disassociation or something like that, you can give it to them and ask them to answer the questions. So it, it's a very easy to use tool. So assessments. Now remember, screening was we are going to do a very quick, uh, I was going to say assessment, but I don't want to use that word. We're going to do a very quick evaluation of everyone and figure out who in this group is at nutritional risk. Uh, the purpose of the assessment is then to diagnose malnutrition, identify underlying pathologies, and plan and conduct nutrition interventions. So the screening is identifying people at risk. The assessment is why are these people at risk? To what degree are they at risk? And what are we going to do about it? And again, just like before, there are tons and tons of options available. There's uh, the subjective global. There's the must. There's a GNRI. There really is, again, no endorsed or best option for these. A lot of it is, what do you like? Now, um, I said earlier, I got to set up where I where I work. I got to set up the nutrition documentation. 
Uh, I like the subjective global assessment. Appropriately, this is just a subjective my opinion of it. But again, I like that it's designed for elders. It is specifically targeted toward the elder population. It does require diagnostic skill, so you do need somebody who is trained at using it to, or trained in nutrition and um, dietetics to be able to do it. The good news is that's totally you. You can handle that, um, but it can't just be anybody. It, it combines intake, measurements, and assessment of overall condition. Uh, so these are generally questions of like, what sort of disease processes does that person have? Uh, how do they feel? It asks, it asks them, how do you feel overall? What, how would you rate your health? Um, it can include labs. Not every SGA does. There are some different versions of it. Uh, the one I have at uh, where I work does have labs in it. It's that's more of a issue for regulatory compliance, though, than that. I actually believe that's that important. We will be asked. So I thought it would be best to just have it. All right. That was very short and sweet. This is actually a very important topic, but it's also not a lot to talk about. It makes sense. So just keep in mind that a good dietary history is key to identifying malnutrition or those at risk of malnutrition. Each system has challenges, right? There isn't one that works best. The um, multiple 24-hour look back appears to be the best, most accurate version of this or best system to use, but it also has problems. And that the consistent use of assessments leads to better patient outcomes. Find a validated tool you like, stick with that, unless you get told this is what we use, and then use that one. And again, consistency is more important than which tool you choose. All right, that is unit one. You guys have a great day. Uh, any questions, you let me know. And I will catch you at unit two. Bye.